Hello, I'm Pastor Dave, and this is our sixth session of our Refresher on Confirmation. Now tonight we're continuing our time within the Apostles' Creed with the sixth article, which states, The third day he rose from the dead. Now as we begin, I do need to ask an important question. What is resurrection? Take a few moments. No, I will tell you that wasn't meant to be a trick question. Quite literally, when we say resurrection, we typically mean, one, the physical return to life from the dead. At its core, that is what resurrection is. Now, there is some minute details that we'll get into between the difference between resuscitation and resurrection, but it is both the spiritual and physical return from the dead. And this is important for us as an article of faith because, as it states, on the third day he rose from the dead, that is part of what we believe as an Easter people. God resurrected Jesus Christ. Now, as we jump into this, the first thing we're going to look at is actually from the Anglican Church in North America with their very recent commentary to be a Christian. And when focused on this, they do write in response to the question, what does the creed mean when it affirms that Jesus rose again from the dead? And if they write, it means that Jesus was not simply resuscitated. God restored him physically from death to life in his resurrected body, never to die again. His tomb was empty. Jesus had risen bodily from the dead. The risen Jesus was seen by his apostles and hundreds of other witnesses. It does dwell on the important distinction between resuscitation and resurrection. Resuscitation, meaning someone is physically dead but brought back to life, as often happens in hospitals today. Someone can die, be flatlined, but return to life. But the resurrection of Jesus was different because, as we will see next week, Jesus never died again. After the resurrection, he ascended. But before we dwell in the more practical implications of this part of the creed, we do need to fully understand the doctrinal basis for this and what Christianity, especially classical Christianity, does tell us about this event. So we're going to look again at the Catholic Church's catechism and specifically looking into what they say about Christ's risen and resurrection, re resurrected humanity. They write, Christ's resurrection was not a return to earthly life as was the case with the raising from the dead that he had performed before Easter. Jairus' daughter, the young man of Nahum, Lazarus, these actions were miraculous events, but the persons miraculously raised returned by Jesus' power to, to ordinary earthly life. At some particular moment, they would die again. Christ's resurrection was essentially different. In his risen body, he passes from the state of death to another life beyond time and space. At Jesus' resurrection, his body is filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. He shares the divine life in his glorious state, so that St. Paul can say that Christ is the man of heaven. That reminds us of the fullness of the resurrection, that it's more than what was seen and experienced in this world, but also with what came about through God's work and what the promise is for us. Now, it does remind us of an important question and something else we have to look at. 
where else do we see in Scripture of those raised from the dead? I'm hoping you were paying attention because the answer is very clear. The answer is Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, and we will see more under the apostles. That's the power of the Holy Spirit because it is a work of God. But at its core, we must remember what the Catholic Church teaches and what actually all of Christianity holds to when it comes to the resurrection. And that is that this is truly a work of God. Christ's resurrection is an object of faith that is a transcendent intervention of God himself in creation and history. In it, three divine persons act together as one and manifest their own proper characteristics. God's power raised up Christ, his son, and by doing so perfectly introduced his son's humanity, including his body, into the Trinity. Christ is conclusively revealed as Son of God and power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. St. Paul insists on the manifestations of God's power through the working of the spirit who gave life up to Jesus' dead humanity and called it to the glorious state of lordship. This is the full work of God the full trinity raising Christ from the dead. But that's the doctrinal side of this. There is a practical side, and that's where we're going to pop in with Dr. Tennant, because he describes more what's happening and what it means for us. And he really points out there are three things that we need to remember. The first is that the resurrection is a public demonstration of God's victory over sin death, and hell. This is something that he notes fulfills what he said in John 11, in 25 through 26, where he says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe it? Christ's resurrection, as done through the whole power of the Trinity, shows that Christ fulfills this. He is the resurrection, he is life, and promises the resurrection to those who believe in him. This is not about the teachings of Jesus, especially the moral and ethical teachings. This is about the power of God and the power of God's full display on earth, being able to break the laws of biology, to break the laws of physics, to break everything we understand to demonstrate God's full power and agency over sin and death on earth. Second, Dr. Tennant tells us that the resurrection of Jesus is the guarantee of fruit, first fruits of our future bodily resurrection. This is here for a reason. The idea of a bodily resurrection is important. And we see this in Jesus with actually having his wounds still intact. He actually had a bodily resurrection. And this is purposely, purposefully here. One of the early heresies of the church was Gnosticism, which basically part of it was the body was inconsequential, the soul matters more. And that had other amplifications of the power of God in the spiritual realm versus the earthly realm. But here we see in the resurrection, it's not just the resurrection of the soul. It's the resurrection of the body. And we do see that there is a change in the process. After the resurrection, Mary confused Jesus, whom she knew very well, for the gardener. We see this when Jesus traveled with the two disciples on the road to Damascus. No, it wasn't the road to Damascus, that was Paul. The, on the road to Emmaus, there we go. And they didn't recognize him until he broke the bread and they saw who he was revealed 
through the act of the sacrament. And we see it in telling Thomas to touch his hands and feet and put his hands at his side. The wounds are still there, but yet Jesus is different. And this goes back again to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, where we start to see, this is for the doctrine and the practical align. As they write, by the means of touch and sharing a meal, the risen Christ established contact with his disciples. He invites them by his way to recognize that he is not a ghost, and above all, to verify that the risen body in which he appears to them is the same body that had been tortured and crucified. For it still bears the traces of his passion. Yet at the same time, this authentic, real body possesses the same possesses the new properties of the glorious body. Not limited by space and time, but able to be present how and when he wills. For Christ's humanity can no longer be confined to earth and belongs henceforth only to the Father's divine realm. For this reason, too, the risen Jesus enjoys a sovereign freedom of appearing as he wishes, in the guise of a gardener or in the forms familiar to his disciples, precisely to awaken their faith. This is a reminder that this is not just a spiritual resurrection of Christ. This is the physical resurrection, something that normally we would not expect to happen. But Christ is still God, hence why he could not disguise himself, but have Mary not recognize him, or the disciples not recognize him. But at the same time, able to do miracles that physically shouldn't be able to happen, like appearing to the disciples when they were behind locked doors. And this is also where Dr. Tennant points that there is a difference between resurrection and resuscitation. Because Lazarus and Jerry's daughter and Peter's mother-in-law would all die an earthly death. But Christ would not. And that's where that first fruits come in. Because this is what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who had fallen asleep. Christ is going ahead of us and doing and showing us the way. He is the first of the resurrected, the, the new Adam. And those who have faith in him may follow him. We will follow him through a bodily and a full resurrection. Body and soul to be with him. Finally, Dr. Tennant does note as his third point, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what makes Christianity unique among all world religions. This is something that is inherently true. We can look at the Abrahamic part of the world religions tree with Judaism, Islam, and then you even point out some other Middle Eastern religions, and you look at the moral the ethical, the philosophical teachings, and they are pretty much there. Even some of the stories are similar. You can actually find matching verses between a Bible and the Quran. And we can find similar teachings in other world religions, especially on how to live life, how to be a good person. But our faith isn't based on the teachings of Jesus Christ alone. Our faith is based on Jesus Christ, on the resurrection, that Jesus Christ is not a teacher, but is the Son of God who rose from the dead and will raise the faithful to be with him. A place beyond sin, a place beyond death. Now, I'm not saying this as a means of condemnation, but and pointing out that within Christianity, in a large tent, we often have on doctrinal issues and ways of thinking and biblical interpretation. This is one of those walls of the tent. You're either inside of it or you're outside of it. And that is what's uniquely Christian. 
And that's where we're going to wrap things up for this week. Now a reminder, if you haven't done so already, continue to memorize the Apostles' Creed. It is a concise statement of the Christian faith, and I encourage you to have it memorized so you know what, in its basic form, what the church teaches. Now, if you want to go further with this, I want you to reflect on really what it makes Christianity different from other faiths. What makes us different than others? Of course, you can also ask yourself, can we still be Christian without the resurrection of Jesus Christ? That could be a fun one to dwell on. Now, next week, we'll move on to the seventh article of the Apostles' Creed. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. I look forward to seeing you next week.